So we're looking at Lady Macbeth in Act 2, which is the scene where Duncan is murdered. OK, um, the first thing we need to do is think about how is Lady Macbeth presented in this act? Um, and we're coming back to our questions to whether she's a, an evil fiend. Uh, is she a fiend-like queen or actually beneath it is she just a vulnerable human being like the rest of us? Um, at times in this act, she presents herself as bold and ruthless and determined. And of course, that's how she wants to come across. Um, in many ways, she does come across as more confident than Macbeth, um, you know, particularly in, in Act 2, Scene 2. Um, you know, Macbeth, as soon as he commits the act of murder, as soon as he commits the act of regicide, is, is crumbling and is uh, saying he couldn't say our man and he thinks he'll never sleep again and he's he, uh, you know he's very aware of the, the the impact psychologically of his own actions um he's he's aware that of the the you know the, the consequences of of what he's done um lady macbeth both before and afterwards tries to put on a brave face um she tries to come across as uh this this bold confident character who ruthlessly wants to go ahead with the murder and doesn't regret it afterwards um, at the beginning of Act Two, uh, Scene Two, we get um, this line from her where she's talking about the drink that the Chamberlains, the Gar Duncan's guards, have been drinking that she provided them with. And she says, she talks about the alcohol she's given them. And she says, that which hath made them drunk hath made me bold. What hath quenched them hath given me life. And so the, the scene starts off with this statement of boldness and confidence and determination. Um, you know, there's no sense of, uh, you know, regret. She's determined on this course of action. Um, uh, as, the, the, as the scene goes on, um, she, there, are, there are cracks in that facade, um, which we'll look at a little bit later. She, she's quite critical of Macbeth, of her husband at times during this scene, though. Um, so when uh, he brings the daggers from the murder scene, when he uh, uh, brings the daggers back down, the, the idea is that he should have left them there because um, then it will look as if it's the guards, the chamberlains who have uh, committed the act. Um, and yet he brings them from there and says that he dare not go back. Um, he's, he, he doesn't want to look at the scene again. And uh, Lady Macbeth is very critical of him in that respect she you know she accuses him of being weak saying you're infirm of purpose um and she says she will take the daggers back and 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 if there's blood there she will smear it all over the guards faces uh so she's quite critical of her husband at that point and trying to draw a distinction between her being quite resolute and bold and confident and determined and and his weakness and yet the reality is that if you look carefully at the things that she says and the way that she's acting She's far from that kind of bold, determined, ruthless character that she's trying to present herself as. Um, let's look at the evidence that actually she's a vulnerable human being then. Um, the first, I, I think the most obvious example in this scene is where um, she talks about having been in Duncan's bedroom and she says, had he not resembled my father as he slept, I had done it. So she's saying, if I if I hadn't looked at Duncan, King Duncan, as he was sleeping and thought that he looked a bit like my father, I would have gone ahead. I would have committed the murder, um, which is astonishing, really, um, because if you think about it, you know, in previous scenes, she's been very much representing herself as uh, as wanting to strip herself of any feminine char char characteristics, any sense of compassion and care and tenderness um and uh you know she she very much you know she asks to be possessed by evil spirits she says come you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty she says come you know take my milk for gall take away anything uh you know nurturing and positive and compassionate and tender within me and replace it with bitterness and poison and evil Think about how she was talking to Macbeth in, in Act 1, Scene 7, when she says, I have given suck and know how tender it is to love the babe that milks me. 
I would, while it was smiling, have plucked my nipple from his boneless gums and dashed the brains out as you so, as I'd so sworn as you have done to this. Now she's, she's suggesting she'd be prepared to dash a baby's brains out. And yet here she's saying, oh, I couldn't go ahead with the murder because he looked a bit too much like daddy. You know, there's a, there's, she's not prepared to admit to herself the reality, which is that she is a vulnerable human being just like anyone else. Um, she wants to present herself as completely ruthless and evil, completely lacking in any human characteristics. But there's a gap, isn't there? There's a gap between the image she wants to present of herself and the reality. Um, and what she's trying to do is she's trying to sort of suppress all those human feelings and reactions and thoughts. But actually, even at this stage, even in this scene, where she and Macbeth are going ahead with the murder, even here, she doesn't actually succeed in completely denying and suppressing those normal human characteristics and reactions and thoughts. She tries to, but we can see them, um, you know, appearing through the, the cracks in the way that she's speaking here. Look also at the very disjointed speech at the way that Macbeth and Lady Macbeth are uh, speaking. Um, you might want to look at Act 2, Scene 2, around line 15 onwards here. Act 2, Scene 2, line 15. And uh, there's a lot of tension in this moment. Lady Macbeth says, I heard the owl scream and the crickets cry. Did you not speak? Macbeth says, when? Lady Macbeth says, now. Macbeth says, as I descended. Lady Macbeth says, I. Now, if you look at that line, they actually, normally you'd expect there to be around 10 syllables in the line. But it's very, very disrupted. Um, and so you get you get four syllables from Lady Macbeth then one from Macbeth then one from Lady Macbeth and then three from Macbeth. It's very, very juttery and disjointed and disturbed, the structure of this line. They can't finish a whole line. They're so on edge. They're so nervy, so tense, so shocked by, uh, you know, by what's going on and by what they've done that they can barely speak to each other. There's that this breathless tension going on. Now, you wouldn't be like that if you were as coldly ruthless as she would have us believe, would you? If you actually were filled from the crown to the top, top full of direst cruelty, if you didn't have any compassion or tenderness or genuine human feelings within you, if you genuinely were the kind of psychopath that was prepared to dash a baby's brains out against the wall, then actually, why would you be nervous? Why would you be tense at this point? You might even, you know, be just calmly enjoying the moment, mightn't you? No, but she's, there's, a, there's such a tension here. Um, this, in terms of the mood that's created through the, the, their dialogue, the way that they're speaking to each other. But again, I think it reveals not just Macbeth's, but also Lady Macbeth's uh, very human side here. Um, and then finally in this bit, I think you could say that she claims that they should be able to put the murder behind them. Um, rather than it having any long lasting effects. Um, uh, and first of all, she advocates suppression. So that this is this is her proposal. She just says, just stop thinking about it. Um, avoid thinking about the event. That's the best way of coping with the situation. She says when she's talking to Macbeth, she says, consider it not so deeply. And then she goes on to say, these deeds must not be thought after these ways, so it will make us mad. Now, of course, this is very much unsound advice, isn't it? Um, and it foreshadows her later descent into madness later in the play. Yeah. Um, her attempts at suppression here, I think, reveal her very human weaknesses. She wants to present herself as wholly evil, but it's just a front. It's just a facade isn't it? What she's trying to do is block out those thoughts and trying to get Macbeth to block out those thoughts, to bottle them up, to squash them down. Um, but it doesn't mean that they're not there. It just means that at this stage, what she to some extent is succeeding in doing is just stopping them coming to the forefront of her mind. That guilt, that shock and horror and regret and remorse, that's all there. Um, and the, you know, the trauma of it all is all there, but she's just trying to suppress it. And she, to some extent, manages to do so 
perhaps more successfully than her husband at this stage in the play. But then, of course, later on in the play, she pays the consequences for that in terms of the, you know, the psychological consequences in terms of all the the sleepwalking and talking in her sleep and seeing hallucinations. And then eventually it seems to lead to her suicide, doesn't it? Of course, the other thing that we can say here in terms of um, her claiming that they should be able to just put the murder behind them is uh, in relation to the blood, isn't it? Because uh, Macbeth says, if I wash my hands, my hands are so red with blood, with guilt. If I washed my hands in all the seas in all the world, then it would make the seas red rather than washing my hands clean of, of the guilt that I'm experiencing at the moment. In contrast, Lady Macbeth says, oh, a little water clears us of this deed. That's all we need to do. We just need to wash our hands and it's all over and done with. We can just wash our hands of this, just physically washing our hands and getting the blood up will mean we don't need to think about this any longer. Of course, here Macbeth is perhaps more, uh, more perceptive, more astute to the reality of, of, of you know, the consequences, psychological consequences of what they've done than she is. Okay, finally then, she attempts with varying success to respond to the discovery of the murder in a way that will not cause others to suspect her and her husband. And I say varying success because it, she's not wholly successful in, in terms of how she, she tries to do this. Macduff, you'll remember, comes, he's the one that's been knocking on the, the, the castle gate and door. And he, uh, because it's his job to wake up Duncan in the morning, and he comes in and he goes into um, to, to Duncan's bedchamber and sees the king murdered with blood everywhere. And he comes out shouting, oh, horror, horror, horror. And um, uh, Lady Macbeth is there. And initially, Macbeth won't tell her what's happened. Um, but he talks to Banquo and, and explains that, that Duncan has been murdered. And Lady Macbeth's response is this. She says, what, in our house? And Banquo says, well, too cruel anywhere. And it's interesting, I think, at this point, that that's not quite the response that Lady Macbeth should have been giving. Um, the king has been killed. Duncan has been killed in the bedroom right next to where she's standing. Um, and her response is, well, in our house? You know, what, she, what she's trying to suggest is, oh, the shame, the dishonour that this has brought upon me and my husband, that such an evil act should have been committed under our roof. But that's not quite what she should be thinking at this moment, is it? I mean, that's, that shouldn't really be your first thought, should it? It might be your second or third thought. It might be what you'd expect her to think later that evening or, you know, the following day. Um, but your first thought shouldn't have been where the murder has taken place, but just the fact that it's happened, shouldn't it? You know, that someone's just been brutally murdered. Um, the king has just been killed. Scotland is without a king. Shouldn't those things be your first thought, not the fact that it's happened under your roof? Um, and Banquo comments on that. He says, well, too cruel anywhere. What, what, what do you mean? Um, so I think the point here is that she misjudges the appropriacy of her response. It's not quite what she should be thinking and feeling at this moment. And perhaps that reveals how shaken she is by events. She's not thinking straight, so she's not quite coming out with the right lines to play the part that she's trying to play. Perhaps she's more traumatised and more shaken and disturbed by what's been happening than she would care to admit. Macbeth then starts speaking as the conversation goes on, and he reveals that he has gone in and murdered the guards. And uh, because and he, he gives a very long speech um, about how he was so shocked by 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 what he thought they had done, um, that he murdered them out of anger at that moment. He recognizes, well, oh, perhaps I shouldn't have done. But I was I was just so furious at, at what the guards seemed to have done because they were covered in Duncan's blood that I couldn't stop myself. And so therefore I murdered them. Macbeth is digging himself into a little bit of a hole because everyone else is thinking and saying, well, why did you murder the guards? Well, you know, they were the only two potential witnesses. Maybe they were guilty, but but we could have questioned them. We could have found out what had happened, couldn't we? We could have 
probe this a bit further now that you've killed them well you know why did you why would you do that um and so everyone else is kind of questioning what Macbeth's done and Macbeth gives a very very long speech and he's not stopping or showing any signs of stopping and so at one point then Lady Macbeth faints and uh, in order I think to uh, sort of distract people and to take the attention away from her husband who is digging as I say digging a bit of a hole for himself at that point uh, it's quite an interesting response from her at that moment isn't it um, and I think perhaps is Shakespeare emphasizing how manipulative and how duplicitous she can be here she is you know she's just you know uh, taken part in the in the, the murder of a king um, you know she's just been part of an incredibly evil plot um, and yet um, she's now feigning shock and grief isn't she she's pretending to be the the kind of delicate woman that that can't quite cope with the news you know in the way I suppose that Macduff was assuming she would have been when when Macduff could could barely bring himself to to voice what had happened in front of her and here she rather than being this you know this ruthless evil murderer um as as she's you know wanted to become and has wanted to present herself to her husband at least um here she's she's capable of of looking so innocent and so shocked by the, this by the, the whole turn of events that she faints in front of everyone and i suppose it really emphasizes again just how two-faced she can be and how she ca she is capable of of acting in this way um if necessary in order to uh to take the attention away from her and her husband and in order to try not to lead others to suspect them.